Our text for meditation this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. I will read the first part of the text. <laughs> then Jesus left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he asked. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from he who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. I suppose I should start out with the same thing I started out in second service, which is, will wandering Pastor Zarling fall off this thing on his first living praise Sunday? <laughs> if I do, it is still all to the glory of God. <laughs> We've got that down. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not what you would call incredibly politically informed. I mean, I try and pay attention. You know, I try and keep abreast of the things that are going on, but it's, it's hard. I'll try and read things now and again. One of the things I do try and do is, at least once in a while, to read an opinion piece or something of that effect that is written from someone who has a completely different viewpoint than mine is. Well, this past month, one of the ones I remember, it really sticks out in my head, there was an article, and you still see it around on the internet now and again, it's, it's, I think it's gaining traction, but there was an article by an academic feminist, and she examined all the things going on in this world. So you have violent crimes, murders, assaults on women, or you have major attacks. And she said, if you take all these things together, the common denominator is men, the male gender. And so her conclusion was that the problem is men. That's the issue our society is facing. Now, I think most of us would agree that that's a little extreme to just take half the population and say that's the problem. However, there's an element of truth to what she's saying, isn't there? I'm speaking to people who understand the truths of Scripture, and men, guys, after the fall into sin, does testosterone always make men do things that are God-pleasing? Nope. There's an element of truth to what she was saying. The problem is she didn't realize that sin is the real component in that issue. Now, brothers and sisters, I bring this up because this question about the two genders, about how men and women interact with each other in this world, this is a hot-button issue right now, especially in our society and in our country. In fact, kind of throughout the Western world right now, this issue of how the two genders relate to each other, or how many genders there are, is the other question. But this whole thing. And if you listen to the answers, even if you just give a cursory bit of attention to it, you'll hear a lot more confusion and anxiety than you will comfort or truth. Well, in our text for this morning, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with one sentence, with one phrase, it's five words long. 
With one sentence, he completely overturns the entire discussion concerning man and woman. And so I say to you, what God has joined, don't separate it. What God has joined, don't separate it. Because finally, he joined himself to you. To save you. What God has joined, don't separate it. <clears throat> now as we begin to look at our text, we are in Mark 10. I'm sure many of you remember the past several weeks we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark 10, and today in our text, everything gets set in motion by a single question. The Pharisees come to him in verse 2, and they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce a woman? Now, brothers and sisters, that question is not nearly as simple as it seems. That's actually a very layered question. In fact, one thing to keep in mind for your own private study of the Bible and as you read the Gospels, whenever the Pharisees use a question to try and trap Jesus, they're usually using questions that had been debated for over a hundred years. That's usually what's going on. You think of examples like, remember when they tried to trap Jesus by asking him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Uh, another question that they tried to trap him on later was, the Sadducees came and said, is there a resurrection? This is one of those questions. Is it lawful for a man to divorce? I think we sometimes think of it as if, like, the Pharisees got together in the synagogue the night before and were like, okay, you guys know what we're going to do? Do you have a good question? We've got to stump this guy. I like that, Bob. That's excellent. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to ask him. That's not what they were doing. Not at all. They were using questions that had been academically and theologically debated among the rabbis for decades. And this one here, this was a big one. For over 100 years, they had been debating what constitutes a lawful divorce in God's eyes. And you had schools of thought on this from different major rabbis like Hillel or Shammai. The school of Hillel actually said that you could divorce a woman if she burned the bread for dinner. That was a lawful ground for divorce. The school of Shammai was a little bit more moralistic. They said that you could divorce a woman if she left your house without a veil. These are what these schools were. This was a big debate. What constitutes lawful grounds for this? And you can understand why they're trying to trap Jesus with this, right? Because they're thinking, we've been talking for a hundred years about this and we can't get it. There's no way he's going to be able to answer this in five seconds. So that's what they're doing. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And you look at how Jesus responds in verse 3. He cuts through the whole debate, and he goes right back to Moses, doesn't he? In verse 3, he says, what did Moses command you? Then they answer in verse 4, well, Moses allowed us to write a certificate of divorce. And then, Jesus gives them an answer that is incredibly simple and incredibly powerful. Listen again to what Jesus says in verse 5. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So basically, this is Jesus' answer. No, divorce is not lawful because God created two genders. That's pretty much Jesus' answer. That's the reason he gives. Divorce is not lawful because God created two genders. He created man and women. Therefore, divorce isn't lawful. 
The implication being that God wants men and women united. Because think about it. Let's say, if God wanted to, could he have created the human race with only one gender? Could he have done that? Yeah, he could have done that. He's all-powerful. In fact, there's things in this world right now that we see that don't need to mate to reproduce. Trees don't. They have only one gender, and in order to reproduce, they drop seeds. God could have made a human race with only one gender, but he didn't. He made mankind with two, man and woman. And that is Jesus' reasoning. Divorce is not lawful because God created two genders. And he wants them united. And from there, Jesus then goes forward into marriage itself, the highest expression of that unity. And that verse, verse 6, you've heard it three times this morning, right? It's been in every one of our lessons. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus is actually saying something very firm here. He's making a very firm assertion. In this culture, in early Judean culture, you know, in the, around this time period, if you would have asked most people what's the strongest bond of love between two human beings, most of them would have said uh, between parents for their children. And marriage love at this time was mm, maybe, sometimes, no. And here Jesus says, no. In God's eyes, the strongest bond of love should be between husband and wife. That's what Jesus is saying here. Something very, very interesting and very important for our times too, right? Because Jesus is saying here that in God's eyes, you are not one flesh with your children. In God's eyes, you are not one flesh with your parents. You're not one flesh with your friends, and you're not one flesh with your siblings. In God's eyes, you are only one flesh with your spouse. Jesus is being very direct here. Very, very direct. Now, brothers and sisters, let's take a step back and look at this from the big picture of what Jesus is saying here. Because everything goes hand in hand. This all goes hand in hand. Jesus starts out by talking about the basic relationship between men and women in general, and then he moves on to marriage, the highest expression of that unity. And all of it goes hand in hand. And at the heart of all of this is Jesus saying, divorce isn't lawful because God created male and female. He created two genders. And he seems to be implying something. If you have a society made up of men and women, and every society is made up of men and women, if you have a society made up of men and women, and you rip marriage out of that, if you make marriage nothing more than a piece of paper that anyone can break when they want to, if you make divorce very easy so that marriage is nothing, and you have a society of men and women, it seems that what will happen is that instead of men and women being united, they will be in competition. They will be antagonistic, distrustful of each other. If you rip out God's de design for the unity of the two, you will end up with two genders in competition. Man, that reminds me of something. I feel like that really reminds me of something. Oh, yeah. The society we're currently living in. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake, the world wants us to divide on ex in exactly the place, along exactly the lines where God wants us united. I mean, think about it. How does the world want you to ide identify according to your gender? Ladies, the world wants you to say, I'm a woman. First, foremost, and first of all, I am a woman. 
womanhood in opposition to man. I'm a woman in contradistinction to man. And men have been holding us down for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Guys, how does the world want us to identify? I'm a man. I don't need help. And if I look at a woman, I should either just treat her as an object for my pleasure, or if I'm watching TV, they're telling me that I should get mad at her because she's nagging me and I'm trying to watch football and eat pizza for eight hours. That's what's sold as what a guy should do. Either be misogynist and treat women like they're nothing but objects of pleasure, or be incredibly lazy and just get mad at women all the time. That, this, is, this is what sold us of how men and women should identify themselves. It's the vision. And it's totally foreign to Scripture. It's completely foreign to how God wants us to look at ourselves and each other. When you look at it through Scripture's eyes, ladies, how can you identify as a Christian woman? How can you identify as a daughter of Sarah without immediately thinking of a man? The man who saved you, Jesus Christ. How can you do that? Guys, how can you possibly identify as a Christian man, a son of Abraham, without immediately thinking of the picture Paul gave us in Ephesians? That we are part of the church, his bride. That's a feminine picture. God purposely made that a feminine picture. How can we identify as a Christian man without immediately thinking about my sisters in Christ? It's impossible. God wants us to be united, that we identify ourselves as his children and we immediately think of the other gender. And yet all too often, we have followed the division of the world. Whether you're married or not. Trying to divide what God has joined. To rip apart what he's brought together. But brothers and sisters, the great truth is that God, when he joins things, he doesn't want them separated. And nowhere did he ever prove that point more than when he joined himself to you. See, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God could have easily looked at the entire human race and said, you're the problem in this relationship. And he would have been right. You're the problem, and if I get rid of you, that fixes the problem. He could have done that, and he would have been perfectly right in doing so, and yet he didn't. In fact, instead of getting rid of us, he became one of us. He embraced us. And as Jesus Christ, his only son, hung on the cross, suffering the pain, the punishment, and the penalty for our sins, and as he breathed his last in that moment, God embraced you. He joined himself to you. And in baptism, he bear-hugged you with an eternal bear-hug of holiness and righteousness. He has wrapped the coils of his love around you. And God is so perfect, and Christ's blood is so strong, that the second you came into contact with him, your sins were totally blotted out. God has joined us to him, and he has joined us to each other. We are united, fastened to Christ and fastened to each other. Finally, brothers and sisters, the world definitely wants us to divide along the very lines where God says, no, I want you, to, I want you to united. I want you together. Christ will not be without his bride. And his bride, the church, cannot be without her Christ. What God has joined, don't separate it. Christ and his bride, 
That is a profound mystery. Amen. Would you please rise?